Now bear with me here because I have two remotes and I'm not sure which one works. <laughs> Got it. All right. This morning we're, uh, we're continuing in our series on the book of Joshua and we're going to look at five chapters this morning. We are not going to read all five chapters. Um, but I, let me encourage you to do this. Each week in the worship folder there is, is a, uh, a little reference as to what next week's message is. You also have that in the newsletter, but each week in the, in the worship folder, there is a, it's at the bottom of the inside page, it says what the scripture will be as well as what the title of the message is. I want to encourage you, if you don't do this already, please read that each week so that you're a little bit prepared when you come here. Case in point this morning, we're not reading five chapters, but hopefully this week you were able to do that. So, we're going to cover five chapters in Joshua. If, if you're the kind of person who likes to walk through cemeteries and read tombstones, um, tombstones that you never knew, people that you never knew, then, then you're going to love these five chapters. Um, but let me state one thing before we, um, we get to these five chapters. Um, notice how, how detailed these five chapters are. Um, there, there are very minute details in these chapters. You can see very minute details in the division of the land among the nine and a half tribes of Judah. Wait a minute, I thought there were 12 tribes. Why only nine and a half? Well, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh They've already received their land on the other side of the Jordan River. And now these remaining tribes, the nine and a half tribes, are lining up to receive their land as Joshua parcels it out. And he does that parceling in very minute detail. Now, what does that say to us? Well, it says that the book of Joshua is not a book of fiction. Um, this is a very real historical event, a fact. And that says to us practically that the God we worship is a God of history, his story. He cares about what happens in the process of history. History is the place where where God does his thing. So what? Well, if you were a believer in an Eastern religion, one thing that you would know is that you're called to get to nirvana. That is outside of history. That's the, the plane where all the, the fleshly stuff happens. And, and that's where you want to avoid. The Bible says that's ridiculous. God's here, and God does his thing in history. And if you want to know what God did in the past, get a history book. You want to know what God does in the present? Then get online or read a newspaper, but, but hold your Bible in the other hand, because the Bible is a history book, and that gives us a proper interpretation, the proper interpretation of history. Some history books lie, but not the Bible. It is detailed to the extreme, and it is absolute history. Tony Campolo, I mentioned Tony Campolo last week, and, and uh, I'm going to give you another reference. Tony Campolo uh, once said, the second coming of of Christ is when Jesus comes back and ends what we began. But let me add this to what he said. He will bring to a conclusion what he started in us. History is all of God. When you feed a child, when you're involved in politics, when you serve your neighbor, you are cooperating with the God of history. So here's what we're going to do when we look at these five chapters this morning. 
Uh, first, I'm going to give you a handle so that you can, you can study them for yourself. And then I'm going to pick one, maybe two points <clears throat> from each chapter. So, chapter 15 of the book of Joshua describes the land that was given to the tribe of Judah. Okay? It says in verse 1 of chapter 15, The allotment for the tribe of Judah, according to its clans, extended down to the territory of Edom, to the desert of Zin, in the extreme south. So the point I would make is that when you have a lot, God requires a lot. Judah was the foremost of all the tribes of Israel. From this tribe of Judah would come the Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It was the biggest tribe. It had the, the, the greatest military prowess. Judah was, Judah was really something else. When you study this chapter, this chapter 15, you will notice <clears throat> that, that Judah was surrounded by enemies. To the west, there were the Philistines. To the south, there was Edom. To the southwest, there were the Amalekites. When you've got a lot, God requires a lot. I look at, at this church family and, and, and most of you, especially by the world standards, have a lot. Some of you have lots of money. That's great. Romans chapter 12 says that that's okay. Never be ashamed that you have a lot of money. The question is, God would ask what you've done with your money. Some of you are popular. That's great. What have you done with your popularity? Some of you are teaching. What do you do in your teaching? And what is it that you teach? Some of you are really good with administration. That's really good. Some aren't, some are. What are you doing with the gift that you have of administration? What have you done with what you have? It says in, in Luke chapter 12, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Now you combine that with Matthew chapter 25 in the New Testament. And what that says is either you use it or you lose it. The same with Joshua chapter 15. You use it or you lose it. Now here's the second point. The, the downfall of of Judah happened not because of their enemies, but because of Judah herself. Let me share some scripture with you. It's not going to put it on the screen, but let me read this to you. This is from the book of Lamentations, the very first chapter of Lamentations. It goes like this. <clears throat> How deserted lies a city once so full of people. How like a widow is she who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. <clears throat> Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. After affliction and hard labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. All her gateways are desolate. Her priests groan. Her young women grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Did you catch that? It's because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before the foe. Then it says in, in the third chapter of Jeremiah these words. I thought that after she had done all this, she would return to me, but she did not. And her unfaithful sister, Judah, saw it. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. Yet I saw that her unfaithful sister, Judah, had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery. 
God will deal with our enemies if we deal with ourselves. In 1940, an official surveying the, the ruin of the occupation of France said, of the four major problems that caused this, they are all inward. <clears throat> and the biggest one, <clears throat> excuse me, is alcoholism. You know, when you're, when you're successful, you, you, you tend to believe that the world owes you success. The problem is you begin to believe that you're not vulnerable. You know, remember, remember what was on the tombstone of the hypochondriac? I told you I was sick. <clears throat> you don't find that on very successful people who have fallen into this particular sin. No, nothing bad will ever happen to them. I've noticed that marriages <clears throat> can survive without much money. But oftentimes marriages cannot survive success. You know, the biggest sequoias in California were destroyed by little tiny grubs within the tree itself. So now we have the 16th chapter. And this 16th chapter describes the land that was given to Ephraim. Ephraim, it was, it was beautiful. It was fertile. Uh, that was the good news. The bad news is that the land was also occupied and already occupied <clears throat> by some fierce enemies. It says in the 10th verse, they did not dislodge the Canaanites living in Gezer. To this day, the Canaanites live among the people of Ephraim, but are required to do forced labor. To see, the problem is the land was occupied. And so here's, here's what you can take from that. The best costs. I remember growing up in my neighborhood, lived in a nice neighborhood. And uh, there was a Jewish boy who lived on the street be below me. His name was Andy. Andy was a great Great swimmer. Matter of fact, they had said in, uh, in school that he was Olympic material. And he swam the 50 and the 100 meters. He was fast. He was very, very fast. And then drugs. What a waste of talent. If he wanted to be the best, he needed to choose. And the sad part is... He did choose. You can do great things with what you have. Or you can have talent and potential and never reach it, regardless of your age. There's another reason why we as Christians don't do our best. Uh, we simply don't want the hassle. Uh, we, we want to be medium. It's okay to be average. You know, the best land always costs. And I really believe that that's, that's one of the major problems in our country as well. We don't have workaholics. We have lazaholics. And we have to pay the price unless you want medium land. 17th chapter uh, describes the the land given to Manasseh. <clears throat> and, uh, and here's what it says in Manasseh. I'll read this to you. This is from the 17th chapter, verses 14 to 18. The people of Joseph said to Joshua, Why have you given us only one allotment and one portion for our inheritance? We're a numerous people, and the Lord has blessed us abundantly. If you're so numerous, Joshua answered, and if the hill country of Ephraim is too small for you, go to the forest and clear the land for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Raphaites. People of Joseph replied, Hill country is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites who live in the plain have chariots filled with iron, both those in Beth Shan and also its settlements and those in the valley of Jezreel. But Joshua said to the tribes of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, You are numerous and very powerful. You will, not only ha you, you will have not only one allotment, but the forested hill country as well. Clear it. And its farthest limits will be yours. Though the Canaanites have chariots filled with iron, 
Though they're strong, you can drive them out. <coughs> so here's the point. God always tests the genuine. You say you're strong. You say you're numerous. Show me. God tests the genuine. And the genuine can always be tested. You ever see a, a mother bird try to get the baby bird out of a nest? No, 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 no. That's not right to do. You know, the mother, mother's fluffing and, and kicking and doing everything to get baby bird out and because she knows that the bird can fly. And God does that with us. The genuine are tested. Any of you ever heard of the Velveteen Rabbit? Velveteen Rabbit's about a, a, a rabbit that, that wants to be real. And uh, instead of being a stuffed animal, that's a perfect example of wanting to be genuine. How do you become real? Well, God shows you. He, he tests you. This tribe, Manasseh, said, we're great. And God says, okay, good, show me. That's chapter 17. Chapter 18 describes the land given to Benjamin. It says this in verse, eight, verse 11. The first lot came up for the tribe of Benjamin according to its clans. Their allotted territory lay between the tribes of Judah and Joseph. <clears throat> now, that was only a throughway. <clears throat> it was small because the tribe of Benjamin was small. It was the smallest of all the tribes. The first king of Israel came from Benjamin. Judges chapter 5, verses 13 and 14 says, The remnant of the nobles came down. The people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots are in Am Amalek, Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Maker, captains came down. From Zebulun, those who bear the commander's staff. These guys, these Benjamites, were tough guys. Jeremiah, the prophet, came from the tribe of Benjamin. The world's greatest missionary, the Apostle Paul, came from the tribe of Benjamin. The point is, big, big things come from little places. This church will never, ever, ever be a mega church. It won't. That's okay. Because of our size, even if we grow much, 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 much more, which we should, we should realize that big things come from little places. God can use us just as well. Chapter 19 describes the last of the land, the last six of the tribes. Simeon, Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. And then this says, when they had divi finished dividing the land into its allotted portions, the Israelites gave Joshua, son of Nun, an inheritance among them, as the Lord had commanded. They gave him the town he asked for, Timnah, Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, and he built up the town and settled there. These are the territories that Eleazar the priest, Joshua, son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel assigned by Lot at Shiloh, in the presence of the Lord, at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And so they finished dividing the land. So for all practical purposes, Joshua's work is now done. So we're going to look at some of his speeches in the coming weeks. But for the most part, Joshua's job is done. He needed to help divide the land and he needed to conquer the land. And one verse is given to the allotment of Joshua. Everybody gets theirs before Joshua got his. And I think there's, I think there's some dignity in that. 
It sounds kind of like Jesus. The first shall be last. If you're going to lead, you need to be willing to follow. Or this point, if you're going to be big, you need to be little. You look at the world and, and you see how messed up everything is. And if you don't think the world is messed up, we need to talk. So um, this little Amish girl was going to eat her candy. And she's just ready to dig in. And her mom said, you know, you should wait for the family and the friends to share your candy. They're coming this afternoon. So she packaged up the candy and, and they waited to the afternoon so everybody, everybody could have some. And so that afternoon, everybody gets together and, and she got out her candy box and she went around and, and she gave candy to every single person and she got done and she put the lid back on and her mom said, aren't you going to have any? She said, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I was here. That's what a real leader does. You want to lead? You're willing to be a servant. And that's the way God works. And we kind of forget that we're here. So this morning, we're going to have Share in the sacrament of communion in a way that perhaps you remember growing up. Um, many times when I uh, prepare us for the sacrament, I'll, I'll tell you a story or get our, our minds and our hearts ready. But in the front of your hymnal, and I don't want you to turn there because that's not what we're doing, but in the front of your hymnal there's a, there's a, a, a litany called the Great Thanksgiving. And for many, many years, all around the world, people share in what's known as the Great Thanksgiving. And so I have on our screen this morning a condensed version of the Great Thanksgiving. Some of you remember that. Some of you, uh, uh, some of you like to share in communion that way. And so we are going to share in the Great Thanksgiving this morning. We'll still share by you know, intinction. But in other words, you come forward, you take the bread, and you dip it into the cup. But to prepare for that, um, we're going to share in the great Thanksgiving. One of the reasons, I, and I've said this to a number of people, one of the reasons why I'm not comfortable many times in responsive readings, and this is just me, is that I'm more worried about making a mistake in what I say than actually what I'm saying. I don't know if many of you are like that. Um, and lots of times when you do something over and over and over and over and over again the same way, we lose the meaning of what it is. But we haven't done this for, for a number of years. So I thought this would be a, uh, a good thing to do this morning. And so the words will be on the screen. The words that you will be repeating are in bold. And the words that I will share are just the words that are printed regularly. So let's share in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, Father Almighty, for your strong and loving arms encompass the universe. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And in you, we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert us. Your love remains steadfast. In Jesus Christ, your word dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, the great lion of God, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light and savior to the nations. He called you Abba, Father.
Father. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death, even death on a cross. Through his death, you took our sin and destroyed its power over us. You raised Jesus from the dead and poured out upon us your Holy Spirit and made us the people of your new covenant. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this. As often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty works in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, along with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the cup. Make us to be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Church, or the Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So this morning, what we will do is I invite you to come and share in the sacrament together. This, this bread represents the body of Jesus, which he said was broken for us. And also this cup, he said, represents my blood, which was poured out for you. And as often as you take and drink, remember me. So I invite you to come. I invite you to come and realize the cost also the privilege, also the love that was shared as we share in this sacrament together. Please come.